Welcome to Our Hope, a production of Chosen People Ministries. The period of time from the beginning of Rosh Hashanah to the beginning of Yom Kippur is known in the Jewish community as the 10 days of all. During this time, it is believed that God opens the book of life in preparation to write down the names of the people whose sins are forgiven. These 10 days are not just a time of waiting, but a time of actively praying, repenting, and seeking forgiveness from those they may have hurt. On today's episode, we want to explore why this intermission between holy days is important to Jewish people, what we can learn from it as believers in Jesus, and how we can share the gospel with Jewish people during this time. To help us explore these topics, we have invited back one of our staff members, Brian Crawford, who is our resident expert on Messianic apologetics. Brian, welcome back to Our Hope. Thanks so much, Abe. Great to be with you again. The last time we spoke, you were temporarily in California because of the coronavirus and just moving your family safely from the <laughs> epicenter. Um, but now it's permanent. <laughs> is yes, that right? it is. It's funny how uh, 2020 shakes up a lot of things in life. Yeah, we we moved out here. Well, we we escaped out here to California from Brooklyn back in March thinking, okay, we'll be out there for a month or two and then we'll head right back to our house. And months went by and months went by. We had a baby out here. Or we had a <laughs> California baby born out here. Wow. And uh, yeah, the grandparents have been amazing. And the grandparents um, and the grandkids are, uh, they're just best buds now and they have never <laughs> been able to be with each other like this before right and uh, life and ministry has been going just fine out here so we recently made the decision to yes make our move here permanent that's awesome can you just briefly talk a little bit about that why can your uh ministry what you do with chosen people ministries continue out in california so I'm pretty unique when it comes to the staff members of Chosen People Ministries mm -hmm. because my ministry is focused on online messianic apologetics. Mm. I was already working from my computer every day. Just give me a laptop and Wi-Fi and I'm good. My staff members are all already all over the country. I've got a web development team that's outside of the country. Uh, I was already remote. And so once coronavirus hit, uh, nothing really needed to change for me. That's that's not the case for a lot of our other staff members, right. but uh, my ministry has not really been affected. So now you're in California, and I asked, I asked you about New York food. Now I need to know California food. <laughs> What's your favorite California food? Uh, man, I am back into the land of plenty of good Mexican food. The <laughs> yes. food trucks, the burritos, the uh, breakfast burritos. Oh my goodness, I love the breakfast burritos out here. Um, we, we just didn't really find that much good Mexican in Southern Brooklyn where we were for nine years. So <laughs> yeah, I'm glad lots of back. bagels, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of bagels, not enough tacos. That's awesome. Uh, well, thank you for joining us again. Uh, really appreciate your time and, and talking through, um, something that maybe believers really don't know a lot about. Um, I, I, I believe, I think believers know enough about Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, uh, but there's something that happens right smack in the middle of those, uh, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's called the 10 days of awe. So could you tell us a little bit about that? What are the days of awe? Yeah, good question. I think a lot of believers are unfamiliar with this topic because this is not strictly a biblical topic. We don't find the days of awe. When you read through, say, Leviticus chapter 23, and you see the different festivals mm -hmm. that Israel was required to, uh, to be a part of. Right. Um, but it came about in later Jewish tradition as a way to really bring out the, the meaning and the depth of what 
Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are really supposed to be about. Mm. And so the Days of Awe are 10 days in between uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And these are days where you are supposed to make sure that you have repented over all of your sins that you committed in this last year. Right. And I think your intro did a pretty good job of explaining how uh, in Jewish tradition, there's a, a book of life and you want to have your name inscribed in the book of life. Right. And that brings God's blessing and that brings God's favor in your life. And the book is uh, opened, uh, according to Jewish tradition, on Rosh Hashanah. And uh, the the really righteous people already have their name inscribed in it. Mm. Uh, but you can't really assume that you are one of those righteous people already. Uh, mm. It's it's kind of counterintuitive. If you were to assume that your name is already inscribed in the book of life, then you're probably being prideful. <laughs> and then that kind of makes it so your name shouldn't be in the uh, book erased. of life. So, so everybody assumes that uh, their name is not written in the book of life when it is first opened. Hmm. And therefore, you have an opportunity over those 10 days to repent of your sins so that at Yom Kippur, your name will be inscribed in the book of life. That's very interesting. So what, what kind of things do Jewish people do during these days of all? Yeah, they're very very somber days where you're supposed to be very uh, focused and uh, yes, repentant over um, all of the mistakes and all of the sins that you have made uh, between God and man in this last year. Um, so in in Judaism, there's a very strong component of needing to ask for forgiveness from people that you have wronged mm. before you can actually receive forgiveness from God. Mm. So if you hurt somebody like your, your, your family member, your spouse or your neighbor, if there's something that you did to them in this last year that you, you realize that was not good, that was a sin or that was unfair or that was impolite or that was, that just really hurt them. You can't just sit privately in your own house or even in the shul or in the synagogue and just say, God, forgive me for that. Uh, in Jewish tradition, you need to go to that person wow. and you need to uh, directly ask their forgiveness or else God will not forgive your sin. Mm. Uh, you have to first get it from the person you hurt. And so this is a, a season where uh, Jewish people are required to go to their spouse and go to their family members and beg for forgiveness. Wow. And so it's a really heavy time where people are really cognizant of how much they have failed and are really want, wanting uh, to have that release and relief that comes from uh, receiving forgiveness. Wow. That's so interesting because it kind of runs counter to some of the culture that we see today where family members and friends go years and years without talking to each other. And this kind of forces community to remain community um, and forces you to just step out of your comfort zone and um, just let your guard down and just, you know, like, hey, I'm sorry I did this. You know, I think the world could use a little bit of that. Nowadays, For sure. I know. mean, uh, we, we can all get our grudges and we can all get cold with people in our lives. But in in traditional Jewish practice, those things are not supposed to last longer than a year. Right. You are you are forced to come back. Yeah, you can you can have a chip on your shoulder. But if you want forgiveness from God, then you need to deal with that. And you need to deal with that in a very uh, humble way face-to-face, eye-to-eye mm. yeah. with the person that you're having issues with. Yeah, not through text or a social <laughs> yeah, media Yeah, please not through text. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what rabbi has issued a ruling <laughs> on whether or not uh, forgiveness can be offered uh, or given uh, through, through a text message. Right. Please, no. So what role does the Day of Atonement play during this season? So the Day of Atonement is the the uh, the capstone or the 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 final uh, peak of this season. 
Uh, everything is moving toward the Day of Atonement being the day when uh, not only have you been through 10 days of receiving forgiveness from people in your life, but now on the Day of Atonement, you're receiving forgiveness from Hashem, mm. from, from God Himself. Wow. And so everybody's thoughts during these 10 days are focused on, I want to be forgiven by God at the end of all of this. Right. And so the Day of Atonement is a day where you spend um, all day in fasting and you go to uh, you go to the synagogue, you go to the shul and you uh, read the Torah and you pray and you ask God for forgiveness. And uh, the, the prayers that are prayed during this this service are just uh, amazing with the, the depth of the repentance. And, uh, and you're supposed to just lay it all out on the line. And so this, this is a season, uh, this is not, uh, you know, this is not a season where it, it really fits in with the common misconception of Judaism, that mm -hmm. it's a legalistic religion that's just focused on doing a bunch of laws. Mm -hmm. No, this is a season looking forward to the Day of Atonement where they're recognizing they have not followed the laws. Right. They have not followed uh, what is required by God. And so they're down on their knees. And this is a, a real season full of, of, yes, repentance in the heart. And it's a, it's a really beautiful season. Mm. Anytime I think of Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, I always think about Randy Newman's testimony, who, who we played in uh, episode one, season three. And uh, he mentions that he gets to the end of Yom Kippur and he doesn't feel, uh, you know, like he's free from his sins. And then he looks down and realizes he wore the wrong shoes. And so now he, <laughs> right. needs, to, he needs to wait a whole year <laughs> to, <laughs> to, you know, receive atonement. And it, it's just such a it's such an interesting testimony um, because it, it's like, oh, he put all this pressure into this day. Um, but he messed up. He, he made, he made the wrong decision and now he has to wait 365 days for it to come again. Right. You know, yeah, the wrong, wrong shoe choice totally yeah. undoes any movement of the heart <laughs> and repentance. Uh, so th there's, right. there's some aspect to that where sure, there's still this idea that I got to do it the right way. Right. If I don't pray the right way, if I don't repent the right way, if I don't, if I don't ask forgiveness the right way for right. everybody in my life, then maybe I can just torpedo this whole thing. Sure, there's that real uh, fear during this season. Yeah. Um, so that it's 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 not a season where you actually have a whole lot of peace. Mm -hmm. uh, you have hope, but you don't really have much assurance about uh, everything that's going on. I think there's also some parallels too with with believers um, and, and this idea of you know, the works to be forgiven. Yeah, sometimes believers just feel like they they have to do things in this order or, or they won't be forgiven. There's, it's almost like there, there's no grace, you know, they're, they're, they they kind of forget the, the grace that's involved in our relationship with God, you know? Right, um, and Yeshua, Yeshua addresses that in his Sermon on the Mount, yeah. where he, he he's talking to religious Jewish people, and he says, you think you're going to be heard because you're out on the street corners and you're saying the same prayers all the time? Right. And then he turns to Gentiles and he says, you think you're going to be heard because you babble the same words over and over and over again? You think that if you say the right words, you have the right incantations, uh, that God will be required to move? And he says, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. God knows what you need right. before you even pray. And he knows that you need all these things. So seek his kingdom and his righteousness, yeah. and then all these things will be added unto you. He, he completely Amen. inverts the whole situation where it's not that you pray the right things to get the right things, is that you seek him and you follow him in yeah. from the heart and with, yes, with your actions, your works. Um, and God... Uh, walks with you and he provides for you in the in the ways that you need amen shalom my name is nicole vaca and i'm one of the co-producers of our hope podcast we created our hope to be a window into the messianic community a place where we can discuss israel and the bible and a resource for people who want to share their faith more effectively and compassionately with the jewish community 
If you are interested in supporting what we do, you can donate to Chosen People Ministries at chosenpeople.com slash donate. You can also support us by sharing this podcast on social media with your friends and family or by writing a review on Apple Podcasts. We are so grateful for your support and we hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. So let me ask you this. Do Jewish people have any assurance that their sins are forgiven? Uh, Unfortunately, they often do not. Uh, Sometimes there is this sense that when you do walk out of Yom Kippur, that, uh, that yes, your sins are forgiven. And you're actually um, uh, encouraged to really believe that your sins are forgiven once uh, the 10 days of are over and you have gone through the prayers uh, at Yom Kippur. Um, but at the end of the day, it's oftentimes very difficult for Jewish people to believe that simply by asking for forgiveness and going through these prayers, that their sins are actually forgiven. Mm. Um, It's a, it's a, it's a real existential crisis oftentimes uh, of, uh, I've been told that my sins are forgiven, but are they really? And I think that there's a really good example of this in Jewish tradition. It's a, it's a really sad story, um, but it, it comes from the first century. Uh, It comes from, uh, just a generation after Yeshua, mm-hmm. uh, there was a rabbi named Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai. And he was one of the few uh, Pharisaic uh, religious leaders who survived the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD or CE. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, because he survived, he was able to preserve the traditions and the practices and the prayers of uh, Pharisaic Judaism. And then he established a a new academy. And then that's, that's where, that's how traditional Judaism was able to survive and flourish. Well, there's a story of Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai on his deathbed. And he's surrounded by his disciples. So like Yeshua, Rabbi uh, Yohanan, he had disciples himself. Mm. And his disciples are around his bed, and they're they're telling him how much they love him, and he's they're they're calling him names like "You are the light of the world," and "You're the pillar of the earth," and they're talking about this rabbi in such sh- such um, uh, magnificent ways because mm-hmm. he's the one who saved Judaism. And they notice that the rabbi is crying, and they say, well, "Why are you crying, rabbi?" And the rabbi is very honest with his disciples. He says. I'm going to go before the King of Kings. I know that I am, I'm dying. And I don't know which way he's going to have me go. Mm. I don't know if he's going to have me go to the left into his presence or to the right into Gehenna, Mm. which is hell. He says, I don't know which way he is going to send me. And that is why I'm crying. And what's so sad about that story is that this is the man who saved Judaism. Yeah. He's the one that everybody looked to for confidence in how their sins could be forgiven with the lack of a temple. And yet even this rabbi, this light of the world, according to his disciples, had no assurance himself. Mm. And I just find that story to just be so sad. Yeah. Because um, how, if he couldn't make it, if he couldn't have assurance, How could anyone like me or anybody else have any assurance? It's kind of like what Yeshua said. um, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm. And I don't know how my righteousness can exceed Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai or any of the other Pharisees. So how can there be any hope for me? What are some of the ways Judaism has attempted to deal with the loss of the temple? That's a great question. I get this question pretty often from believers in Yeshua because we are so uh, familiar with the New Testament's teaching 
that we need to have uh, both repentance and a blood sacrifice on our behalf for us to receive atonement. Mm. And the question is, well, what about Jewish people who don't have a temple anymore? They don't accept Yeshua as the Messiah, and they don't have a temple, so uh, how do they get uh, atonement with no sacrifices? And um, there's a lot of different reasons why Jewish people uh, believe that they can receive atonement uh, without a temple. And the, the process of going through uh, the 10 days of awe and Yom Kippur, that is uh, a very strong uh, reason. Uh, repentance, and that's, that's probably the most popular one, that repentance actually transcends the need for sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Uh, that sacrifice is not necessary. But there's other ways that uh, Jewish sages have attempted to answer the question. Uh, they try to substitute sacrifice by prayer mm-hmm. or substitute sacrifice by studying the sacrifices in the in the Torah or uh, substituting for the sacrifices by suffering themselves mm. or by giving charity or by um, doing better next time um, or by doing one mitzvah perfectly so that it, uh, it covers over all the ones that you didn't do perfectly. Mm. Uh, there, and even in Kabbalah, there's this view that if you mess up in this life, well, you can be reincarnated and you can try it again next time. Wow. So there's so many different methods that traditional Judaism has come up with to try to deal with the loss of the temple. I'm, well, the New Testament makes it clear that Jesus is the only way to salvation and the forgiveness of sins. So there have to be some problems with these alternative methods for getting atonement. Why don't these traditional Jewish methods work? Yeah, great, great question. It, it really comes down to how the Torah itself explains what is necessary for atonement. And it does not say that sacrifice can be replaced or annulled Mm -hmm. or can be transcended. Um, All of these ways to try to uh, replace sacrifice with something else, that is not something that Moses actually said that you can do. Mm. And uh, many traditional Jewish people they take what Isaiah and Hosea said about how God doesn't need the sacrifices, Mm -hmm. and they emphasize that, and then they de-emphasize what Leviticus actually says, which Leviticus says, if you sin, go get that sheep, go get that ram, and go take it to the priest and sacrifice. That doesn't really work today. And so they're emphasizing the prophets at the expense of the Torah. Mm. Well, the New Testament says we don't need to a pit the prophets against Moses, that we can actually have uh, the repentance required by the prophets and the sacrifice required by Moses at the same time in the same person, and that is Yeshua, who is our high priest, who is the one who serves as our sacrifice, who is able to forgive our sins, and it's through repentance uh, and belief in him and his ability to forgive our sins, uh, that we can have atonement uh, in the same way that was given in in the Torah. Mm. So just to wrap up, it's a two-part question. What are some lessons as uh, believers in Yeshua? What are some lessons that we can learn from repentance in Judaism and from the 10 days of all? And then during this season, what can we do uh, for our Jewish friends and family members? Um, How can we remember this time of repentance with them, alongside of them? Great. Yeah, I think there's a lot that we can learn from this season of repentance in traditional Judaism, uh, especially if we as believers in Yeshua are not practicing this kind of repentance ourselves Mm. in our own life. Uh, it's easy for us to kind of say, well, I've been, I've been justified by faith in Yeshua, that I am righteous because of what he has done for me, and then kind of not really focus on the need to uh, repent for the sins that we still commit, right. despite the fact that we have been justified through faith. And so uh, the, the prayers that are prayed during 
the synagogue services. I think they're really helpful for us. Mm. Uh, they pray, we have trespassed, we have betrayed, we have stolen, we have slandered, we have yeah. caused others to sin. Uh, we have sinned with malicious intent. Uh, the, the prayers go through such detailed repentance. And I think that we as believers in Yeshua, we could we can pray those same prayers and attempt to uh, put ourselves in the same place of humility before the Lord, but at the same time, never forget that he is actually hearing our prayers and he does give us uh, the atonement and the forgiveness uh, that we are seeking through the blood of Yeshua. Uh, and then your second question, how can we stand with our Jewish friends uh, during this time and also present uh, the good news of Yeshua to them? I think a really good question would be to ask is, how are you doing in this season where you're thinking about your sins? Mm. Is this hard for you? Is this is this something that you're actually connecting with God over? Or does God feel distant? Um, and if you are connecting with God, uh, are you are you sure that God is listening to your prayers? Are you sure when you walk out of that synagogue on Yom Kippur, are you going to be sure that your sins are forgiven? And what's the basis of your assurance? Are you getting that from from the from the Torah, from Moses, or is it just because your rabbi told you that your sins are forgiven? What is the basis of your assurance? And maybe if you're not very sure you're you don't really know if god has forgiven your sins well would you like to know how you can be sure of your sins being forgiven mm -hmm. and that is a good segue for talking about how yeshua is the lamb who takes away the sin of the world Ryan, thank you so much uh, for joining us and uh, talking through the 10 days of all. I, I think I have a better understanding and a clearer picture for what this season is. Um, and I'm encouraged to kind of enter it with my Jewish friends and uh, and, and and just just to be a presence during this time. It can be particularly dark, uncomfortable, <laughs> but um, it, I think it's a good time to, to continue to show our love to the Jewish people. It definitely is. It's a it's a heavy season, but it is a it is a perfect bridge for talking about issues of the heart and issues of the gospel. During this time of repentance and reflection, we find hope in knowing that because of Yeshua, we can be assured that there is forgiveness of our sins, and remembering this price that was paid for us will help us forgive others. I'd like to read Matthew 18, 21 to 22. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. So as believers in Yeshua, we don't have to wait once a year to forgive others. Let's continue to forgive others and make amends during this incredibly difficult season that we've experienced over the past few months. Let's continue to love each other. Let's continue to show grace and empathy. Let's continue to be who God continues to call us to be. We are also reminded that many Jewish people may struggle during this time, as there is no way to know whether they have atonement without the covering of a temple sacrifice. So during these days of all, we ask you to pray and keep your eyes open for opportunities to share the gospel of hope with Jewish seekers who long to be reconciled with God. This is the heart's desire of our Messiah. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Our Hope. This episode was made possible thanks to Dr. Mitch Glazer, Nicole Vaca, Grace Sui, Kyron Bautista, and Brian Crawford. Until next time. Thanks for listening to Our Hope. If you like our show and want to know more, check out OurHoperPodcast.com or ChosenPeople.com. See you next time.